Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Life Sciences Grade 12. My name is Jaduzi Lugubega, and on the screen you'll see my email address. This is for when you have any questions or queries regarding Life Sciences Grade 12. And then the topic for today, we are wrapping up homeostasis. We are with the class activity. After this, I think you should be able to track how what you know, what you don't know. Then you go consult further material. Ne? So yeah, we're doing a class activity. It's got it from Via Africa, Life Sciences Learners Book. So you can access that from Snapify. Question one, how is the concentration of carbon dioxide in the body monitored and regulated? This mark, this question is for six marks. Ne? <laughs> so you want to know how the concentration of carbon dioxide in the body is monitored and regulated. You'll remember with homeostasis that it regulates quite a number of things. One of the things regulated is carbon dioxide concentration, as well as oxygen concentration, as well as the glucose concentration, temperature, a lot of things that are regulated, water and salt concentration. But right now, this is focusing on the carbon dioxide in the body. So I went back to this slide here, which has our answer. This is to show you that we did cover this in class with you guys. Remember the slide? Negative feedback in regulating carbon dioxide concentration. So what happens here? Carbon dioxide is a waste, as a toxic waste product of cellular respiration. What does it do? It diffuses from the cells where respiration takes place into the blood. Then the blood transports carbon dioxide to the lungs. Then it is removed from the body during exhalation. The carbon dioxide that is dissolved into the blood turns the blood plasma and the cerebrospinal spinal fluid acidic. Why? Because the carbon dioxide I think you remember from grade 11 when you did the various ways in which carbon dioxide is transported in the body. One of the ways is that carbon dioxide binds with water and it forms what? It forms the bicarbonate acid plus the hydrogen ion. So because of that, that and also when it forms with water and carbon dioxide forms with water again, it, is, it can also form the carbonic acid. So because of those properties there, they do what? They change the blood plasma, making it acidic, meaning they lower the pH level in the blood. As we're saying, when you lower the pH level, you're making it acidic. So what happens then? The medulla oblongata senses this lower pH level. This is a very important center which regulates this process of carbon dioxide. When the medulla oblongata senses the lower pH level, it will respond by initiating deeper, faster breathing by doing what? Ensuring that the heart beats faster. As the heart beats faster, the rate of inhaled air increases and the rate of exhaled air also increases. So by initiating faster breathing in order to reduce the carbon dioxide concentration in the air, in the blood, so that what? Exhalation increases as well as inhalation. Once the normal concentration of carbon dioxide is achieved, then the breathing rate will return to normal. But if the concentration of carbon dioxide is low and the concentration of oxygen is high, the urge to breathe is less and the rate of breathing will be slow. The medulla oblongata only responds to the carbon dioxide concentration and not the oxygen concentration. So that's what happens. When it's, when it's just normal conditions and you have high concentrations of oxygen, then the medulla oblongata is not alerted because it only responds to the carbon dioxide concentration. So we've learned here that when the carbon dioxide concentration is low and the high oxygen is high, the edge to breathe is less. This means when the body requires more oxygen and less carbon dioxide, then you'll be breathing more deeper there'll be deeper breathing, deeper breaths to allow volume, more volume to intake oxygen and to release carbon dioxide. Your heart will also beat faster so that it pumps more blood so that you can increase the rate of inhalation and exhalation. That's why your heart beats faster when you're exercising or often exercise or when you're really scared, no? Because you need a lot of oxygen to replace all of this 
this the one that you have lost in your body so that is the answer to our question over here of how is the concentration of carbon dioxide in the body monitored and regulated you can understand this through the explanation i just did or i don't know it will depend really on the question sometimes this could be an acceptable answer where you show the negative feedback regulation in this in the figure like this you know here in the middle you have the normal concentrations of carbon dioxide and then when there's an increase in carbon dioxide in the blood the medulla oblongata stimulates increased breathing this this also has ripple effects where your heart will beat faster and then you'll be able to take in more oxygen release more carbon dioxide and there's a decrease in carbon dioxide then you're back to normal concentrations of carbon dioxide but if you have low or a decrease in the carbon dioxide in the blood medulla oblongata does not cause increased breathing so it does nothing it only responds to an increase of carbon dioxide so when there's a decrease it will do absolutely nothing then the, the, the increase of carbon dioxide in the blood will happen on its own then you'll have normal concentration of carbon dioxide this this is a figure it, it explains the same thing really i know some teachers i would accept it too if you were to show me this to explain exactly what happens if you can't put it to words but this is still words and you you wouldn't be able to put this in this diagram if you did not understand the words ne? okay at least i think so and then question two describe what homeostatic effect the presence of each of the following hormones has on the body so these are the hormones remember we discussed these hormones in the very beginning last time when we did the endocrine system so yep you remember these hormones we discussed them now we need to describe the homeostatic effect they have the homeostatic effect the presence of these hormones have on the body so we'll start with adh adh you remember this again antidiuretic acid which is antidiuretic hormone and my bad it's adh it is made in the hypothalamus and stored and secreted from the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland adh is responsible for or small regulation, this is very important. So when there's what, what effect is there when ADH is present, there'll be osmo regulation. When water volume in the blood is too high, it means the blood is diluted and the salt concentration in the blood is low. Then the ADH production will be minimal. This causes the walls of the collecting tubules in the kidneys to become less permeable to water. Then as a result, less water will be reabsorbed from the kidney tubules back into the blood. This is a diagram to show you what happens when there's ADH. Normal concentrations of water in the blood, you have them here. But if there's an increase of water in the blood, less ADH will be released by the pituitary gland, which was alerted by the, the, this, whole, this here, hypothalamus. Then now less ADH is released, meaning there'll be a decrease of water. Then it will be back to normal concentrations of water in the blood. But if there are normal concentrations of water in the blood, then there'll be a, then it happens that there's a decrease of water in the blood. When there's a decrease of water in the blood, more ADH will be released by the pituitary gland. Then there'll be an increase of water in the blood. Then the conditions will be back to normal concentrations. So I hope you can correlate these two together, right? ADH is responsible for osmoregulation. So its present presence in the blood or in the body will ensure that osmoregulation is maintained or the water salt balance is maintained in the body. And then the effect of glucagon. I will answer this with glucagon. I'll pair it up with answering for D. So B and C, B and D, glucagon and insulin will be paired. Why? Because these are antagonist, act antagonistically against each other. That's what antagonistically effect means. They act against each other. Meaning if you wanna reduce the factor, you will what? You will you will secrete insulin. If you want to increase the factor, you will secrete glucagon. 
And what is this factor that I'm talking about? It is the factor of blood glucose. So that is the factor over there. So they act antagonistically, meaning they act against each other. They have opposing effects, which is like we're starting here. One hormone, which is this insulin, it lowers the blood glucose concentration by stimulating the conversion of soluble glucose into insoluble glycogen in the liver and muscles. But the other hormone, which is glucagon, has the opposite effect and causes glucose to be released into the blood. Insulin and glucagon have opposing effects, therefore they are antagonistic to each other. Like I just said, antagonistic meaning they have opposing effects, they act against each other. This is a diagram to show you what happens. If you have normal concentrations of glucose in the blood, here, this is, these are ideal conditions. This is how it's supposed to be. But then it happens that there's an increase of glucose in your blood, maybe because of the food you've eaten. Yeah? There's an increase of glucose in your blood. You ate foods that have too much glucose. That will increase the glucose in your blood. And then what happens when there's an increase of glucose in the blood? Increase above normal levels, as you can see. The insulin will be released by the pancreas. Remember, this one here is regulated in the pancreas, which is an endocrine gland. So insulin will be released by the pancreas. What does insulin do? It lowers the concentration of glucose in the blood. So it will decrease of the, the glucose in the blood will decrease. How does insulin lower the glucose levels? We've just seen here. It is involved in the conversion of soluble glucose into insoluble glycogen. So that's what insulin does. It converts the glucose into insoluble glycogen. And there's a decrease of glucose in the blood, then your conditions of glucose in the blood will be back to normal. But what happens when there's a decrease of glucose in the blood? So maybe you haven't eaten or you don't eat a lot enough sugar that is required in your body. There's a decrease of glucose in the blood, then glucagon will be released. When glucagon is released, what does glucagon do? It will cause glucose to be released in the blood. Glucagon is involved in the conversion of, in, in the production of glucose. So then the glucose will be produced. That's why you will have an increase of glucose in the blood. Then your concentrations of glucose will be back to normal. So what's the effect of glucagon and insulin? As you can see, this is the hormone here, insulin. This is the glucagon hormone over here. And then... C, the last one for question two, it's aldosterone. What is the effect of aldosterone? What is the homeostatic effect? You need to be very clear. We are dealing with homeostasis and that's why they are very clear. What is the homeostatic effect? Not just the effect of its, its present, but homeostatic effect. The salt content of the body is regulated by a hormone called aldosterone. So what does aldosterone do? It regulates the salt content in the body. Salt content in the body, regulated by aldosterone. It is secreted by the cortex of the adrenal gland. So the gland involved here is the adrenal gland. The effect of aldosterone is to what? It is to retain sodium ions, which in turn increases water retention and raises the blood pressure by increasing the blood volume in the body. Low levels of sodium as well as low blood pressure will cause the release of aldosterone. So it means when in the body, the, the salt concentrations decrease, meaning the sodium concentration decreases and therefore there's low blood pressure. Then aldosterone will be released to ensure that it increases the, the sodium levels and the blood pressure increases to normal conditions. But when the sodium levels increase, then aldosterone will not be secreted then the sodium concentration go back to normal. The kidneys to increase the reabsorption of sodium back into the blood. So when you increase aldosterone, you will stimulate the kidneys to increase the reabsorption of sodium back into the blood. Water follows the sodium that is being reabsorbed. This increase in water retention leads to an increase in blood volume, resulting in higher blood pressure. If the blood pressure becomes too high, then aldosterone production decreases. You see why? Because aldosterone is involved 
in ensuring that there's an increase of sodium and the increase of sodium results in high blood pressure. So if it becomes too high, then the production will stop. Less sodium is retained and then less water will follow the sodium. Blood volume will decrease and then that will lower the blood pressure. This is a diagram to show you exactly what happens. We have normal salt concentration and blood pressure here in the center. Then if there's an increase in salt level and blood pressure, less aldosterone will be secreted by the adrenal glands. I need you to be able to identify exactly and remember the glands that are responsible for the secretion of a particular hormone. We did those in when we studied the endocrine system in the second term. Then now when less aldosterone is secreted, then there'll be a decrease in salt level and blood pressure. Then your conditions will be back to normal. But if there's a decrease in salt level and blood pressure, then more aldosterone will be produced by the adrenal glands, which will be involved in the increasing of salt level and blood pressure, which will result in your body going back to normal salt and blood pressure conditions. Then that was it for question two. Question three, briefly explain what is meant by the concept of negative feedback. We have done lots of examples ever since here. I've been showing you how, how homeostatic or homeostasis is maintained in the body through negative feedback regulation. So what is negative feedback regulation now if you put it into words, two marks even, two marks. Negative feedback, this is here. In order to maintain a constant internal environment, the human body has a number of regulatory mechanisms. These mechanisms regulate themselves. For example, if too much of a particular substance is present, there needs to be a way to regulate production of that substance and reduce it. Similarly, if there is too little of a particular substance, steps must be taken to increase its concentration such as self-regulating mechanisms called negative feedback. So negative feedback mechanism is a self-regulating mechanism that is there to ensure that conditions in your body are regulated and kept at normal concentrations. So like we've just done here, I've shown you how ADH comes in to ensure osmoregulation. Glucagon is there to ensure glucose concentrations are kept at normal levels. Aldosterone is there to keep water concentrations at normal, uh, sodium concentrations at normal levels. And then insulin is there. So in short, glucose concentrations are kept at normal levels. Even the diagrams here, you will see when there's an increase, a particular action is taken. When there's a decrease of a particular factor, then some action is taken. So that is negative feedback mechanism. You get the, the feedback that this factor has now increased, then there's an action that is taken. But then if this factor is now decreased, then another action is taken. So that is how it happens. Steps are taken here to ensure that self-regulating mechanisms are kept properly and ensure that the body is performing at its optimum capacity. A negative feedback system has three parts, like I've just mentioned. You have a receptor that detects the move away from the normal concentration or state and alerts the appropriate control center. You have a control center that processes the information and initiates an appropriate response. Then you have an effector that corrects the imbalance and brings conditions back to the normal concentration or state. So maybe let's do the example of the glucose concentration. In glucose concentration, where is it here? Let's go to the glucose concentration. There, glucose concentration. There would be an increase in the glucose of the blood. That would be alerted there. That's been alert. The factor is the glucose. The effector would be the insulin that would be there to rectify that action. But the factor here, when there's a decrease, it's still glucose. The, the effector would be glucagon, which is there to react. The control center is the pancreas, as well as the the, what's this, this one? The pituitary gland, which is the control center. The control center is the pituitary gland as well as the pancreas that is involved in regulating and ensuring that the correct hormone is released. Then the correct hormone here is released from the pancreas, which is that control center. Then,
the effector we have discussed it, the one that will be correcting the imbalance. So you understand that, right? We have noted those differences now. This is how we have done all examples that relate to negative feedback. And then question four, which is the last question we are doing. The graph in figure 8.8 shows, let me, shows the response of a person's body to a sudden rise in blood glucose. So this here, this graph shows the effects of insulin and glucagon on blood sugar concentrations. A, we need to suggest why this person's blood sugar levels start to rise at point A on the graph. Why here? Yeah, this is point A. Let's look at point A. Point A is around almost 7 a.m., almost 7. Why is the blood sugar rising? Chances are around 7 a.m. now, this person is probably having breakfast and the blood sugar is increasing. Around 7 a.m. now, there's an increase in a food intake or glucose intake. Ne? That's one possibility because at 7 a.m., people are getting ready for the day. Ne? Then question B, which hormone is released at point B and what effect does it have? So here, your blood glucose has increased. Your blood glucose has increased. You see it's blood sugar. This is blood sugar. Sugar is glucose, right? Oh, yes, that, let's get that clear. We increase here. Then at point B, there is a hormone that is released. What hormone is released here at point B? And what effect does it have? Let's see, after this hormone at B was released, what happened here from point C? It decreased. So after this hormone of B, the hormone was released at point B. Then you can see at point from then on, there was a decrease in the blood sugar. So what hormone is involved in the decrease of blood sugar? It is insulin. So it means at point B, there was insulin that was released to bring down the blood sugar levels. So when insulin was released, it brought down the blood sugar levels in the body to normal concentrations. It brought it down. And then what effect does it have? We, the, so the answer is two parts. Insulin was released. And then what did it do? It brought down the sugar levels to it, it, it decreased the concentration of blood sugar in the body. And then C, what is the optimal level of blood, sugar, of blood glucose in this person's blood? Explain your answer. So what is the optimal level of blood glucose in the blood? So you can even take this from normal, general knowledge that we know. The normal concentrations of blood sugar in a person should be about 80 to 100, ne? about 80 to 100. As long as it fluctuates between the 80 and the 100 mark, then it's normal. But we can see here by this line that the normal concentration should actually be 90 milligram, milligrams. You see here, the line here is showing us that the optimum, optimal level is, it's supposed to be 90 milligrams over here. But we know in normal conditions, for as long as it fluctuates between about 80 to 100, then that's normal. Or even if you've just eaten, then the normal concentrations are about 170 to 200, if you have just eaten. But three hours after eating, the normal concentrations should be about 120 to 140. This is for a normal person who, who is not diabetic or not pre-diabetic, just a normal person. Eh? These are the steps I'm calling out. And then, what is the question again? What is the optimal level? Optimum, optimal level is there, 90 milligrams. Why? You can also see here, two words here, that the body is ensuring from D, D, E, F, G, the body is doing its best to ensure it brings it back down to that. It, it regulates it to be around through that range, that range. You see, it's playing close to that range, around range. So here, it increased that drastically because that person had just eaten. This is normal. If you have just eaten, it's normal that your blood glucose will increase like that. But then the hormones, necessary hormones will take in, will kick in to ensure it regulates it back to the normal concentrations. 
And then D, at, at point D, the dropping glucose concentration starts stimulating the release of another hormone. What is the name of this hormone and where is it produced? So at point D, there's been a decrease, a decrease right now. Now the decrease is below the normal concentration or the optimal level that we've just said at 90. It's now below 90. So what is then kicked in to ensure that the blood glucose returns to normal? It is glucagon. Glucagon will be released. Where is it released from? It is released from the pancreas. Glucagon is secreted from the pancreas. The glucagon will be released to ensure that there's an increase of blood glucose. It is secreted, it's produced in the pancreas. That's where it's produced. Then E, the fluctuations on the graph between points D and G are much smaller. Let's for point D and G, yeah. There, the fluctuations are much smaller. Give the correct general biological term for what is happening between these two points. These two points now, what is happening? There is regulation happening here. So you can say there's homeostasis or you can say there's a negative feedback regulation that is happening here. Because now, it is ensuring that when it decreases below levels, glucagon is released. When it now increases above normal levels, insulin is released. So this is a constant uh, reaction that is constantly happening in your body to ensure that regulation is maintained, order or balance is maintained. Then F, what is the approximate normal range of fluctuations in the blood? Glucose. What is the approximate normal range of fluctuations in the blood glucose concentration when the glucose concentration is homeostatically balanced? So the range, the normal range here. Let's see, we can note it from G, from D. Point D and point F here. The lowest points are about G. G is the lowest point, so it's about 70. The lowest point should be 70. The highest point should be 100. So the normal range is 70 to 100 for this person here. 70 to 100 are the normal, normal range of fluctuations in the blood glucose concentration. This here, like we've mentioned, B. happened just now but i'm sorry about that anyway those are there was a recap for you guys to see where the types of cells involved in the islets of lung and lungs which you find in the pancreas so glucagon is secreted from the alpha cells in the pancreas and then insulin is secreted from the beta cells in the pancreas so this is just recap you can find more of these notes actually from the sections when we did the endocrine system in term two but yep, I hope you understood this. We are done, officially done with the topic of homeostasis. Next week, we are continuing with the syllabus. The material oh, that, of, that I believe you'll find very helpful is the Snaplify app. You can get access to lots and lots of textbooks there. Yeah, solutions for all the life sciences textbook. And then the Via Africa Life Sciences grade 12 learners book as well. All of those will be very, very useful for you guys. And I use them all the time when I consult with my work. See you next week for another week of life sciences. Enjoy your weekend. Take care of yourselves. Bye.